Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We're just waiting for everyone to uh, show up. Here we go, numbers climbing. All right, so um, <clears throat> welcome to um, our fifth uh, Dostoevsky talk of this uh, monumental year for um, Dostoevsky scholars and lovers of the writer. I'm Anton Pidyashin, the, um, uh, the director of the Carmel uh, Institute of Russian uh, Culture and History here at American University in Washington, DC. Uh, welcome back. Um, we started this year, which is the 200th anniversary of Fyodor Dostoevsky's birth with uh, Tom Marullo, um, speaking about Fyodor Dostoevsky's uh, youth. Um, he's got a three volume uh, biography. The third volume is on the way. We moved on to John Gibbons, um, exploring the image of Christ in Russian literature broadly, but in Dostoevsky to be more uh, specific. Uh, Suzanne Fusso uh, joined us with a talk on um, the very influential conservative thinker and editor, Mikhail Gatkov. Um, Chloe uh, Kitzinger um, uh, told us about the literary angle uh, with her talk on um, uh, mimetic lives. Uh, and today we're joined by professor, uh, associate professor Kate Holland. Um, uh, she is professor of Russian literature in the Department of Slavic uh, Languages and Literatures at the University of uh, Toronto, where the weather is still, by the way, remarkably warm, just as it is down here in Washington, D.C. She is also the president of the North American Dostoevsky Society, and we're especially grateful uh, for her joining us today because the society has had a very, very busy year. As uh, many of you know, and some of you um, should understand, she is the author of the novel in the age of disintegration, Dostoevsky and um, a genre in the 1870s, which came out in 2013 with Northwestern. Um, paperback, by the way, just came out this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, she is the co-editor with Catherine uh, Bowers and Connor uh, Doak of a Dostoevsky companion, Texts and Context from 2018. And she is also the co-author with uh, co-editor, sorry, with Catherine Bowers of Dostoevsky at 200, the novel in modernity, which came out with the University of Toronto Press this year. It's the sort of, that's the book that she will be speaking about today. Um, this talk is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted on the Carmel Institute's website uh, within a few weeks. Please remember that you are welcome and you are encouraged to submit questions to the Q&A function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. And when Dr. Holland is done, I will go through the questions and uh, sort of mix them up, uh, intersperse them with my own. Um, we will go until one o'clock today. And with that, Dr. Holland, thank you again for joining us. And I give the word over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. So uh, let me uh, proceed to share my screen, my slides with everybody. And let's see, hopefully that should look good. That Dostoevsky's 200th birthday fell in the middle of a global pandemic when his birth country was near peak levels of infections and therefore almost all of the celebrations ended up taking place over Zoom somehow seems appropriate. That appropriateness comes in part from the fact that Dostoevsky's novels address sudden cataclysmic change. We might remember Toporov's analysis of the number of times the word suddenly or druk appears in Crime and Punishment, or the notes to the adolescent, which speak of disintegration, razlazhenia, uh, or the novel itself, which Dostoevsky at one point considered calling disorder, bezparyadok. And in part from the tensions between the atomization of everyone remaining in their own houses and apartments, social atomization was, of course, one of Dostoevsky's key complaints about modernity, and the overwhelming need to overcome such atomization by making social connections over Zoom. Today, I'm going to spend the first part of this talk giving a general overview of the edited volume Dostoevsky at 200, the novel in modernity. And then for the second part of the talk, I'll move to discuss my own chapter in the volume, The Poetics of the Slap, Dostoevsky's Disintegrating Dual Plot, which typically for the volume deals with how the sense of semiotic crisis of the Russia of the late 1860s, uh, 1870s, is represented in Dostoevsky's novels on the level of plot and gestural poetics. 
My co-editor, Professor Catherine Bowers of the University of British Columbia and I um, completed the uh, manuscript for Dostoevsky at 200, the novel in modernity, in the first months of the pandemic, uh, in that strange atmosphere of ever increasing uncertainty about individual, communal and national plans and projects. Many people talked at the time about the pandemic slowing down the collective experience of time. We thought about this as we planned out the introduction for our edited volume, in which we considered how modernity is expressed in Dostoevsky's novels. Our introduction begins with the railway car of the opening, car of the opening section of The Idiot. We argue that the train is explicitly foregrounded as a symbol of catastrophic modernity and that it brings into the novel the experience of acceleration, which Reinhard Koselleck has seen as central to the idea of modernity. The historian Lynn Hunt argues that the idea of modernity is a complete break from traditional ideas and values as its roots in the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. The experience of a radical break in temporality expressed most explicitly in the conceptualization of the French Republican calendar can be said to inform the 19th century Russian novel from its beginnings, but it becomes much more palpable in the period following the emancipation of the serfs, a moment of rupture, one might argue, perhaps akin to that of the French Revolution in the history of the Russian Empire. Hunt emphasizes the essential core of the concept of modernity as a new way of experiencing time, invoking Kosselleck's discussion of, quote, the peculiar form of acceleration which characterizes modernity, unquote. Acceleration, in Kosselleck's sense, extrapolates Hunt, can be seen as the constant renewal of the difference between the space of experience and the horizon of expectation. In other words, there's a rupture between the experience of the past and expectations for the future. The old blueprint, if you like, um, uh, is not working anymore. As experience and expectation grow further apart, there's an acceleration to try to rush from one to the other. And this sense of acceleration can be found everywhere in Dostoevsky's novels, perhaps most notably in Crime and Punishment, in the rupture of the traditional Bildungsroman structure, as Raskolnikov rejects the path of gradual enrichment over time and embraces the sudden transformation that murder promises to bring, the transformation into a man of action, an extraordinary man. The Idiot is the first of Dostoevsky's novels to so explicitly contextualize this process of temporal acceleration in technological as well as uh, social, philosophical and economic terms through the device of Mushkin returning from Switzerland to St. Petersburg on the train, Dostoevsky stages this moment of rupture between coherent and organized past experience and incoherent and amorphous future possibility as central to the novel that lies ahead. Dostoevsky at 200, the novel in modernity, is con concerned with the ways in which the particular experience of temporality that encapsulates modernity affects the form of the novel as Dostoevsky conceives it, with the peculiar challenges the form faces as it seeks to convey the acceleration of modern life. Dostoevsky was, of course, writing at a time of remarkable change. His return from Siberian imprisonment and exile came in 1859 on the eve of Alexander II's great reforms, a period of social, judicial, economic, administrative and educational reform that saw the emancipation of the serfs, the advent of jury trials, creation of a state treasury and bank, as well as other changes. Between 1861 and 1874, the reforms led to rapid social and economic growth. At the same time, the publishing industry expanded significantly as a result of the development of a mass circulation press, as well as uh, increased literacy rates. More information circulated to more people than ever before in the Russian Empire. And this increase in information gave rise to public debates about science, religion, economics, politics, philosophy and art. At the same time, new breakthroughs in the sciences, new theories of economics and politics, and new advancements in the arts engaged the growing reading public more quickly and more deeply than ever before. 
the rapid changes in the society uh, in the 1860s and 70s were char characterized by a public sense of impending crisis, of swift forward motion, but also an impetus to embrace change as a means to further reform state and society. Um, now, of course, Dostoevsky is ambivalent in all kinds of ways about these transformations, yet at the same time, uh, it seems as though he, he feels a kind of um, imperative nonetheless to uh, represent them uh, in his work. And Dostoevsky at 200 examines how this sense of transformation and acceleration uh, find representation in the form of the novel as conceived by Dostoevsky. It situates his formal choices of narrative, plot, genre, characterization, and the novel itself within modernity, that is within the particular experience of the temporality of the post-emancipation moment. The volume asks how form, narrative, and genre shape Dostoevsky's works, as well as how they influence the way modernity is represented. It considers how modernity, the experience of modernity late led to Dostoevsky's particular engagement with form. The exploration of Dostoevsky's works is not comprehensive. The early works have little coverage here and no chapter is dedicated solely to the brothers Karamazov. The volume focus, focuses particularly on works that fail to conform to conventional generic categories or frames of expectation because of their hybridic, confusing or problematic form, especially notes from underground, the idiot, demons and the adolescent. Those are the uh, four works that recur most um, of all within this volume. Um, and I should also say that um, from the beginning, we conceived this volume as also a former forum for, for younger and mid-career, uh, ju more junior and mid-career stage um, academics. We wanted to um, give voice, if you like, to a kind of a new um, uh, set of, um, of problems, new, new, new research in um, Dostoevsky studies. Uh, let me show you the contents page now. Um, each of the chapters um, deals in different ways with the experience of temporality within modernity. So uh, for the time being, I'm going to leave aside my own chapter here um, since I'm going to move on to that in a minute. And instead, I'm going to give a brief introduction to each of the chapters. Um, Anna Berman's chapter, the second in the volume, uh, examines Dostoevsky's complex treatment of the marriage plot. She suggests that Dostoevsky's marriage plots resist uh, what she calls the genealogical imperative, that they reject the idea of the formation of new family and focus instead on its retention, on the reestablishment of old relations along new lines. Um, so in a sense, she's examining uh, Dostoevsky's conservative approach to modernity, right, as, as building uh, new uh, structures on the old, uh, on, the, on the fragments of the old. Vadim Schneider, uh, the next contributor, examines the gendered aspects of Dostoevsky's representation of the changing nature of economic relations in his novels uh, through the figures of two businesswomen, Alyona Ivanovna from Crime and Punishment and Grushenka from The Brothers Karamazov. And he uses these characters as case studies to illustrate facets of the broader representation of women and monetary systems in Dostoevsky's novels, the way that businesswomen become both economic subjects and objects of force beyond their control. So uh, his chapter is really dealing with the idea of, of realism being challenged by modernity and needing to uh, become in, in a certain way transformed. Melissa Fraser's chapter examines the role of allegory in Dostoevsky's critique of positivist science and contextualizes it within a more general late 19th century European movement to do away with the opposition of mind and matter. So her chapter is um, dealing with Dostoevsky's intervention in scientific discourses addressing modernity. And several of the other chapters do this too. Um, Another of the um, chapters that deals with contemporary science 
uh, is that by um, Alexey Vdovin, who reads Notes from Underground alongside uh, Sichinov's uh, 1863 influential scientific work, Reflexes of the Brain, demonstrating that Dostoevsky drew on contemporary empirical scientific research in creating his narratives and engaged with the polemics surrounding empiricism and evolutionism uh, going on at the time. So here also you, we can see the interpenetration of scientific and literary discourses in these different attempts to uh, respond to modernity. Um, in the next chapter, um, Sarah J. Young examines self and spatiality within Dostoevsky's narratives, mapping the, uh, the narrative mechanics uh, of senses and embodiment in crime and punishment and the adolescent, uh, particularly hearing and seeing. Um, and she argues that Dostoevsky's poetics allow the self to be uncovered only partially. Um, so here too, I think she's um, challenging uh, or she's she's showing the challenges that modernity presents to old forms of representation and how those uh, forms um, have to respond and change. Catherine Bowers in her chapter shows how the Gothic informs the poetics of the idiot through the juxtaposition of Holbein's painting Body of the Dead Christ in the Tomb, of course one of the, uh, the a, a central painting within that novel, uh, with images from the Mazurin murder case um, which was being covered in the press of the day, allowing Dostoevsky to ultimately move beyond the image to engage the reader on an effective level. So here too um, uh, she's showing how contemporary discourses penetrate the novel and uh, transform its mode of representation uh, in certain ways. Um, and then Greta Matznagor examines Dostoevsky's uh, interest in 19th century statistics and probability in crime and punishment and the ways in which uh, this engagement shapes the no novel's narrative creating uh, what she calls a kind of poetics of probability predicated in the social statistics work being published in Dostoevsky's time, which she demonstrates informs the novel's methods of characterization, the structure of its individual scenes, and even the improbable ending of the novel, uh, which sees Raskolnikov's mo moral resurrection. So here too, uh, we see uh, how new ways of seeing the world um, in through the experience of modernity challenge the novelistic, uh, but are then challenged by it also in turn. Um, and then on to the last two chapters, um, Chloe Kitzinger focuses on illegitimacy in her examination of Dostoevsky's approach to the problem of novelistic realism, demonstrating uh, that the illegitimacy of Arkady, the pro protagonist of the adolescent, becomes a model through which Dostoevsky explores new aesthetic and narrative possibilities for the novel within the context of new pressures of modernity. Um, so she's really addressing how literary realism is challenged by modernity and how also Dostoevsky kind of opens up this problem of, of possible shortcomings of literary realism uh, to his readers. Um, and of course, in the uh, that great um, end part of the adolescent, the letter from Arkady's Moscow landlord. Ilya Klieger's chapter examines two of Dostoevsky's novels, Crime and Punishment and Demons, as responses to autocratic power and sovereignty. He contends that the novels explore how the symbolic apparatus of sovereignty and power affect questions of identity and the possibility of action. Um, he is addressing the question of the specific nature of Russian modernity, how it coexists uh, with a mode of autocratic power and its imaginary that belongs to perhaps a pre-modern era and that also helps to explain the peculiarly hybridic nature of the Russian novel. So all of these chapters um, speak to one another in many different ways, ways that we hadn't really envisaged uh, when we first um, planned this um, edited volume. And each open up the ways in which modernity penetrates the old form of the Dostoevsky, in, sorry, penetrates the form of the Dostoevsky novel on multiple levels and in multiple forms, that it ruptures the old forms, but that out of that break uh, somehow emerges uh, a kind of fundamentally new form. 
So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about my own chapter, uh, which analyzes the slap within Dostoevsky's poetics and how it reflects a, cr a crisis of representation in Dostoevsky's novels uh, from Notes from Underground onwards. I argue that the slap motif and the dual plot play a crucial role in Dostoevsky's late novels, revealing the state of semiotic crisis within which his heroes function. Um, while slaps and duels seem to evoke uh, the fixed values and symbolic meaning-making system of the honor code, in fact, they uncover the semiotic and social ruptures of the uh, post-reform era, revealing the breakdown of the honor code and the lack of any other mutually agreed upon semiotic system. So, um, in The Idiot, uh, Kolya complains to Prince Mushkin about a conflict that's ended in a slap. Some madman or fool or villain in a state of madness gives a slap in the face and the man is dishonored for the rest of his life and can only wash it off with blood or if the other one begs forgiveness on his knees. I think it's absurd and despotism. Le Lermontov's play The Masquerade is based on it and stupidly so in my view. In the world of Dostoevsky and gesture, public slaps are the last remaining currency of a value system that no longer exists in the world of the late 19th century, the honor code. Gestures and acts that once carried symbolic value become decontextualized within Dostoevsky's novels, transposed onto the level of the absurd. According to the honor code, um, a slap functions as an insult which should draw a challenge. The slap publicly shames the slapped person. That shame can be effaced only by the ritualized violence of a duel, which creates a structure by which the insult can be translated into a contest of social equals where the violence is tamed, ordered, and transformed into an easily readable sign. Traditionally, a slap escalates, but ultimately resolves a conflict over an individual's wounded honor. Intended to provoke a challenge to a duel, it allows the insulted party to translate his own wounded pride into a physical demonstration of superiority, but also to transfer the insult to the symbolic plane, allowing the violence to be translated into a rule-bound system, mutually unintelligible to slap perpetrator and victim. Um, and that comes out here in the quote from Notes from Underground. Still, I slapped him first. It was my initiative. And according to the honor code, that's everything. He's branded now and no beating can wash away that slap. Only a duel is going to have to fight. I argue that the crisis of uh, the collapse of the honor code leads to a crisis of implotment in Dostoevsky's late novels. Uh, theoretically, when the honor code is followed, the dual signify, simplifies both the complexity of human relations and the multiple implotment possibilities that such complexities entail. A dual has a fixed and finite set of outcomes, if the rules are followed at least. Yet in Dostoevsky's novels, the dual complicates implotment rather than simplifying it, diffuses the shame instead of containing it. Already in Notes from Underground, uh, as the underground man fantasizes about issuing a challenge to the friends who've insulted him, we see the difference between the clarity that the dual fantasy is supposed to provide and the shame that it engenders as the underground man realizes that he lacks the resources, imaginative as well as social, to issue a challenge to Zverkov or his companions. He still maintains the boundary between ritualized violence with its attendant and readable codes and random violence being beaten by his opponents without warning. But this becomes increasingly porous in Dostoevsky's later novels, where violence threatens to loo lose the ordered semiotic and clarifying power invested in it by the honor code. The slap um, emerges as a, a potent symbol of the underground man's shame uh, in the first part of Notes from Underground. Uh, he introduces the contradictions of his underground consciousness, revealing that despite his self-love, he might nonetheless derive pleasure uh, from being slapped. 
The duality that it projects immobilizes the underground man, rendering him unable to return the insult and symbolizes his, symbolizing his incapacity to act. It emerges again as the underground man responds to his imagined reader interlocutor's implication that he must have been slapped with denial, undermining the structure of his own argument and the reliability of his own claims about himself. And we have this quote here on the slide. The slap functions here both as the decisive proof of the palpability of the underground man's shame and as something elusive, ontologically unstable, yet semiotically fixed. A slap is the ultimate sign of disgrace, and the underground man is defined by this disgrace. Yet the shameful uncertainty of an actual slap eludes him. It remains within the realm of the theoretical and impersonal. He is defined not by having been slapped, but by the desire to be slapped. The problem of clarifying the status, meaning and significance of the slap as sign and its connection to larger social and historical system becomes a central aspect of its use in Dostoevsky's later novels. A slap plays a crucial role in demons in revealing both the moral and psychological fractures at the heart of the novel's elusive protagonist, Stavrogin, and the contradictory set of semiotic codes according to which the novelistic action unfolds. Shatov slaps uh, Stavrogin soon after his return from abroad, and Stavrogin fails to respond. Characterized as a coward, by the son of a man he had previously insulted, Gaganov, he then issues a challenge to the latter, thus substituting the original slap for the later insult. He refuses to follow the rules of the duel and shoots into the air, leaving the conflict unresolved. Shatov administers his slap to Stavrogin in front of a larger audience at the end of the scandal scene that concludes part one of the novel. By bringing shame and conflict out into the open, it promises resolution and clarification. But instead of dissipating emotional and bureaucratic t and hermeneutic tensions, it aggravates them. The blow itself is half slap, half punch, um, lending it an ambiguous status on the boundary between the ritualized violence of the first element and the base violence of the second. Stavrogin's failure to respond to the blow reveals a rupture in his past and present projected self-image. When he eventually flouts the honor code and with Gaganov's son and the whole dual plot is revealed to, as just one more um, plot development threatening to undermine the novel's structure. The opening chapter of part two reveals a shift in the narrator's focus as the question of why Stavrogin was slapped is subordinated to the problem of how the slap is being the story of the slap is being told. The slap as a response to some chain of events is swept aside in favor of his potential as narrated event, the beginning of a new story rather than the playing out of an old one. The origin of the rumors is revealed as Gaganov, desperate to avenge the insult to his father, sends a letter that refers to Stavrogin's slapped mug, attempting to insert himself into Stavrogin's shame plot and reestablish the honor code. The narrator chronicler provides a colorful account of the background to Gaganov's conflict with Stavrogin, in which he traces the former's sense of shame to the emancipation of the serfs. Um, let me move to that slide. Uh, Gaganov has not lost much revenue as a result of the emancipation and is shaken not by a loss of income, but by the emancipation's semiotic reverberations, by the transformation of the meaning of himself and of his social estate. He falls back on semiotic certainty, provoking a duel that will serve as a grand substitution um, and uh, allow him to, the, him to erase not only the shame inflicted on his father by Stavrogin, but also the broader uh, shame of the emancipation and its changes. The slap and the duel here do not function as motifs within a coherent honor code plot, but instead as vessels of new plot generation, plots more in line with uh, Russian modernity. The dual plot here is a red herring that generates false expectations about Gaganov's motives and the possibilities of effacing the shame of his social position. As a post-reform uh, aristocrat, he seeks the meaning and certainty in the honor code that he fails to find in service post-emancipation. 
the Jew will offer him the possibility of effacing the concrete shame of his father's past humiliation instead of the shapeless shame of his own present socio-historic one. He demands absolute fidelity to the honor code. Lack of definition is his greatest fear. And when Stavrogin insists on firing into the air, he's overcome with a new kind of shame that can no longer be effaced. A post-emancipation Russian aristocrat with a penchant for medieval pageantry, Gaganov is himself a historical anachronism, his shame formless and indefinable, suffused throughout the novel's fluctuating networks rather than easily definable and effaceable. This is the dual as farce, but also as a plot adrift, only nebulously connected to the slap motif, conducted in order to reverse the imminent, imminent historical extinction of his socialist state and its modes of behaviour. The slap and the duel without a shot in Demons continue the process of the disintegration of the honor code that began in Notes from Underground. In Notes, Dostoevsky depicts a world with a tangible memory of the honor code, where romantic uh, models from Lermontov and Pushkin still theoretically offer the underground man the promise of rehabilitating his honor, though this promise is occluded by a closer examination of those models. Demons depicts a world where such a memory no longer exists other than as empty comfort for those such as Gaganov, who declares vengeance on historical process itself. The slap becomes distorted, its symbolic meaning attenuated by ambiguity and the suggestion of raw violence with no possibility of uh, resolution. The slap motif and the aborted dual plot symbolize the semiotic confusion that characterizes the broader atmosphere of a world adrift, unmoored by uh, moral or philosophical values. While slaps and the dual plots they engender seem at first to suggest semiotic and narrative stability in Dostoevsky's novels, they in fact serve as markers of semiotic confusion, of the coexistence of the multiple codes and slippages between them. Ultimately, the shifting meanings and poetics of the slap in Dostoevsky's post-Siberian works work to highlight a broader crisis in semiosis in the post-emancipation era. Dostoevsky at 200 was conceived years before the global pandemic, yet in its analysis of the many and diverse ways in which Dostoevsky's novels respond to sudden cataclysmic change and the multivariant and formless experiences of Russian post-reform modernity, I believe that it speaks to an uncertainty around literary form, experience of time and modernity itself that persists in our contemporary culture. Uh, but before I finish, I just wanted to um, return to uh, our book slide and point out that our book is available to buy um, and it's also available free to download um, uh, from the University of Toronto press site. And I will finish there. Thank you. Excellent. Kate, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Uh, I encourage everyone to buy the book. That's what we've been encouraging everyone to do uh, with uh, the books of all the speakers that we've uh, featured. This is uh, great work. Um, listen, um, we have a, a, a question already, so let me start with the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, please submit your questions to the Q&A function. I'll, uh, I'll read them. Um, this is from um, uh, Raman Tashlitsky, uh, you've been working on this fascinating project on text encoding of Dostoevsky's works using XML tags to represent them in digital form, which provides new opportunities for processing his text. That's one of the many projects that Dr. Holland is involved in. Uh, with the rise of artificial intelligence, can we anticipate that AI will compete, cooperate with humans in interpreting and analyzing literature, and this will discover unseen before facets in Dostoevsky, perhaps to be discussed in the book Dostoevsky at 250. <laughs> right. I won't live that long, but uh, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, yeah, so that's a different project of mine. I can I, I don't want to talk about it too much since I'm here um, to discuss the book, but um, just to say that yeah, I'm 
I'm involved in, uh, in in a project on of computational text analysis of Dostoevsky's novels. Um, of course, Dostoevsky himself would probably have been horrified by uh, such a uh, use of technology. Um, but one of the one of the positives of it, I think, is that um, so there are different types of digital humanities computational text text analysis projects. Some of them cover huge corpora, right? Like there's currently now uh, they're beginning to work on actually 19 century Russian novel um, on in a huge corpus. Um, but mine is actually just on Dostoevsky's novels. So it's it's a kind of narrower but deeper project. Um, and actually the questions that we're asking with this project are similar to traditional philological questions, right? Then the, there aren't really any new questions. Um, in a sense, what is just the methods that differ. So this allows us to kind of get really much more deeply into the text. Um, for instance, uh, one of the things that we've been been working on um, is um, an analysis of the Voynich, the double, and we're interested in kind of spaces of liminality within that work. So there's, as you as you all know, that novel is set sort of in St. Petersburg. It's one of the great examples of the Petersburg text. A lot of it takes place on or around bridges. So that's one form of kind of crossings and liminality. Uh, but we've also identified and marked in the text all kinds of other examples of liminality. So we want to see sort of how how they occur, how they, um, whether there are more of them in certain parts of the text and so on. So um, this kind of work allows us to do all kinds of textual mapping and um, go more deeply into the um, into the deep structure of the of the novels. Excellent. Um, listen, another uh, question from Michael uh, Katz, and this is actually a great segue. Um, thank you from Rahman, by the way, for your answer. Just got that. Um, uh, for Michael Katz, a question on translations. He noticed that uh, all of the translations on your slides uh, were from the uh, Pivier um, Valhomsky, the P and V, I, I assume. Yep. can't stand for anything else, right? I, right, right. Um, um, why do you use that? And in general, as a specialist on Dostoevsky, for those who are joining us who do not speak Russian or do not speak Russian well enough to actually slough through Dostoevsky, by the yes. way, as a native speaker of Russian, I can tell you Dostoevsky is not the easiest going uh, writer, even for native speakers. Um, why P and V for your translations, but also more broadly, for an American who is interested in Dostoevsky, what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And of course, Michael's own uh, translation of Crime and Punishment um, is a great um, uh, one of the many uh, new translations of Crime and Punishment. And actually, yeah, um, I probably should. I have been moving further away from Pavir and Volkonsky. I think a few years ago, there was a sort of, um, you know, there was this general um, acceptance of them as the kind of canonical translations. And I think many uh, rich translations have come out since then. So I actually, in my teaching, I do still use them for the Brothers Karamazov, but actually I've moved away. So Oliver's reddish, um, more British inflected um, translation of Crime and Punishment, I think is really great. Um, there's many other um, other translations too. My, Michael's Crime and Punishment is great. And um, then of course, there's um, there's other um, uh, others too. I think, um, you know, the students are always asking me, you know, wh which, which one to use. I mean, there are so many great analyses um, that have been done by people who I think are more expert than myself in terms of comparing the translations. But um, but the great thing is that we're continually getting new ones. And, um, you know, I think that um, hopefully that will continue uh, into Dostoevsky's third century that uh, he will, you know, no one will rest on their laurels and just say this is the um, this is the translation for all time. But instead, new translations will continue to appear. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, listen, I would I have a I have to throw this question at you. This is from uh, from myself. Um, it is understandable that you you examine the slap as a semiotic what symbol as a device mm -hmm. uh, in the context of characters attempting to reconnect with a previous era, the pre-emancipation era. I have a question that's bothered me every time that I've taught Dostoevsky um, from a historical perspective. Um, this concern with acceleration, 
And this concern with the loss of a reliable ground beneath your feet um, was both a post-emancipation or an emancipation uh, experience uh, for many classes in Russia, first and foremost, of course, the nobility. For Dostoevsky, however, and you mentioned this in your talk, he comes back into a Russia that is just on the cusp of these yep. profound changes. Um, where do you see the relationship between Dostoevsky's experiences in the Omsk stockade, the whole exile experience to be yep. in with, including the mock execution with which, yes, and as the ground being pulled out from under his feet, and then his landing into an empire that is feeling something very similar. Is, are, are you confident that he's just reaction, reacting to emancipation? What degree do you think, um, to what degree was he reacting to his own experiences? Yeah, well, I think that, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think certainly, um, for sure, there, there's, there's personal elements there, right? I mean, in a sense, what um, could shake your uh, sense of time more than, you know, being uh, subject to a mock execution, right? And of course, there's that great passage in The Idiot in which um, and Wishkint also kind of talks about a man, you know, on Im imagines the experience of only having five minutes left to live, right? And the sort of way in which time is, is condensed in those last five minutes. So to have that and then all of a sudden a reprieve, right? And to, to sort of have this kind of um, sudden possibility of a life that you in those five minutes thought wasn't granted you, um, for sure. And also, you know, his gambling too, right? And his epilepsy. So there are all kinds of um, psychological, biographical uh, elements that also um, perhaps contributed. Um, but I, I'm sort of, I've, I guess I've always been interested in in sort of the bigger picture. I mean, it, I became interested in his journalism and I sort of, for sure, the the personal and the individual and the biographical enters into into it. Um, but for me, this is just such a fascinating period, and I think that you know, of course, his is only one perspective on that period, right? And if you look at other writers, you know, there isn't maybe such a sense of disintegration. Although I do think um, you get some of it um, in Tolstoy and certainly um, uh, Soltykov, Shudrin, and so on, right, as well, um, and and also some of the less canonical writers, but. But, um, but yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, let, let me just add one more. Thing. You started talking about right this experience of the the um, um, uh, profound sense of speeding up of time right before the execution. It's interesting that it's followed then by years when Dostoevsky seems to feel like time. Um, not only slows down but almost stops because the years in the stockade with yeah monotony of life and very few things changing, but at the same time, many things happening around him, the fear, the violence, uh, the theater scene, all of this is described, of course, very well and meticulously in uh, House of the Dead. Uh, Dostoevsky himself goes through these um, inconsistent layers of experiencing time, starting with the arrest yes. in the late 40s. Um, so. Um, he lands into he lands into a Russia in fifty nine, right? Once he's he's never left it, but you know, yep. when he comes back to society, um, he lands into a Russia that's going through something he has already experienced profoundly, which, in in my opinion, qualifies him more than most writers, great writers of his own generation, to explore just that uh, that thing. Um, let to another question that was a comment if you'd like to i just if i can just make one comment back yeah um so um yeah and i think the other thing that he gets from his time uh, in the stockade is also um or the time in katorga is also the experience the awareness that 
of that there are different experiences of time, right? And especially yeah. that the peasants who are in that camp have an altogether different type of experience yeah. of, of time and history, right? And so, you know, his, his the renewal of his religious faith and so on, um, and the awareness that there's another kind of, um, so it, it always strikes me in the epilogue to Crime and Punishment, where he kind of looks across the river and he sees those nomads, right, who are experiencing yeah. time in a way that's completely different from Raskolnikov. So I think that there's that also that comes out of his time in Siberia. Yeah, super. I, I agree. Um, let me go to our uh, question board here from Jonathan uh, Schneider. Could you speak to Nastasia, Nastasia Filipovna's role within the theme of change? Is she symbolic of an older Russia frightened of the future or a bystander subjected to rapid change? Thank you for speaking today. That, that's a great question. So I think that um, actually Vadim Schneider has done some really interesting work on um, in the idiot uh, on the idiot in terms of kind of different um, sort of groups of characters and sort of how economic change is represented in that novel. Um, for me, one of the interesting things about Nastasia Filipovna is both that she is kind of participates in in this sort of modern, uh, in a sense, world of exchange and so on, and she's kind of in a way in a way she's sort of she's a currency within the novel, right? And her body is a currency, but at the same time, she herself is kind of trapped actually in a very pre-modern, um, you know, in a in a sense a kind of biblical model of time right whereby her um her fall you know is something that she is continually trying to recover from right and sort of Mushkin, when in her in his relations with her is trying to help her find a way of escaping from that um ultimate definition of kind of having been or, or, or having been ultimately defined in that moment of her fall, right? Of her her fall, her her rape by Totsky, right? And she, but she always also continues to define herself in the novel by that moment. So it's almost a kind of an idea, a pre-lapsarian. She like when she wants to go back to some kind of a pre-lapsarian situation, right? Before her own fall. Um, Listen, since you were on the religious aspect of, of, of things, I, I couldn't help um, asking myself the question when you were uh, speaking um, about the role that you see in that um, of faith in Kanievsky's yeah. works as an attempt to reintegrate the personality yeah. And to deal with this acceleration of time and with this, with the seeming at least disappearance of firm ground below characters' uh, uh, feet. How do you see the role of uh, faith, for example, um, in the attempt to reestablish the connection with the older world of honor codes and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in, um, for instance, there are figures who represent that. So um, I'm thinking that the, w one of the interesting things about demons is Stepan Trofimovich's sort of um, kind of semi sort of redemption or sort of um, uh, almost kind of epiphany on his deathbed that seems to be the only moment in that novel that offers any kind of firm ground at the end. And then um, in the adolescent, the um, um, the peasant um, kind of stepfather of Arkady Dolgoruki, who's a who's a kind of more traditional, who's a sort of pilgrim, right? Who um, whose stories um, serve as a kind of an alternative to. Um, uh, Versil of his aristocratic alienated father's kind of existence and values. Um, but actually this this gets to another question, which is the absence of the brothers Karamazov in our volume. And I think partly what that has to do with is that in a sense, the brothers Karamazov is his attempt to overcome these problems of modernity in a, in a textual form. Right. Mm -hmm. And and what how he does that, um, I talk about this in my uh, first book quite a bit, is he kind of goes back to um, pre-modern religious genres, um, uh, forms of spirituality. So hagiography is important, um, apocryphal texts and so on. Um, so it's not necessarily 
kind of canonical orthodoxy or institutional orthodoxy that offers the answer for him. Uh, but it's a particular vision and that that vision of Christ that he first saw amongst these peasants when he was in Siberia, right? That that here he's kind of trying to convey um, in the brothers Karamazov and use that as a kind of an answer to um, everything that we write about in this volume. Um, so, you know, in a sense, uh, this is a volume about what about what what's broken, right, about the period. But in a sense, the Brothers Karamazov is about trying to heal that rupture okay. um, in the sense of in, in a, on a formal level. Uh -huh. Excellent. Uh, let me go back to the um, uh, question board here from John Givens uh, that we all know and love and respect. Uh, forgive me if you address this. I have to step away for a minute. He writes. What becomes of the semiotics of the slap in part two of Notes from Underground, where the story of the duel between um, uh, the underground man, U.M., and the officer who threw him out of the tavern devolves into an absurd comic episode? Is the yeah. slap we are parodying the idea of honor understood in the traditional and more noble sense? Does this episode undo the idea of this kind of honor code? Yeah, so um, I, that's a great question. So um, I didn't really have time today to go into um, this part of the argument, but I do address it uh, in my chapter. So yes, of course, part two, of course, goes back to it's it moves back in time, right, to the 1840s. So the, in a sense, the romantic models are even more pertinent um, uh, in that uh, in that part of the novel. But yes, um, absolutely, there is a kind of parodic representation of the honor code. But what's interesting, actually, in the article, I go a little bit more into the models themselves. Uh, sorry, in the chapter, I go a little bit more into the models, which is, of course, Pushkin's The Shot, right, from the Bielkin Tales and Lermontov's Masquerade. And actually, when you look closely at the romantic models themselves, they even they offer less firm ground than one might expect, right? So one might say that even earlier within the Roman within the Russian novelistic tradition, uh, or within the Russian literary tradition, that kind of firm ground is already not as firm as it might seem to be, right? So I think that Dostoevsky is also revealing in a way also some um, problems with or or sort of, let's say, lacunae in the honor code, even within the kind of source texts. Um, and certainly we see a lot of that in part two um, as he fantasizes, has these romantic fantasies about um, the duel that never, of course, comes to anything. Um, do you suppose that um, the consequences of the two most famous duels in the world of literature in the first half of the 19th century, Pushkin's and Germantov's, had anything to do with Dostoevsky's use of the duel in any of his works? Or have you found no connection between the two tragedies of 3741? Um, and the way that Dostoevsky approaches the duel at all. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I don't, there isn't really any, tra yeah, there isn't really any tragedy in Dostoevsky's representation of the duel. In a sense, it's it's already in the farcical stage, right? Um, it's already uh, er kind of erupting as farce. Um, yeah. The um, the but but you know, I think it's important to point out that there's there's almost there. I don't think there are any examples of duels that take place in Dostoevsky's novels that actually follow the proper rules of the of the honor code, like all of them are in some way uh, flagrantly, um, you know, um, uh, disregard those rules or sort of end up in some kind of farcical result. Um, I have to let me ask you another question that, that I personally find uh, very important uh, to the evolution of um, literature in the 19th century, not just in Russia, but everywhere else. Mm -hmm. but the manifestations of uh, modernity in the 19th century is the increasingly frequent um, serialization of everything. Yeah. I always remind my students that most of the novels that they read from the 19th century, reg almost regardless and without exception from what country, were serialized and created to be serialized. It's an interesting phenomenon that is part of the acceleration of modernity, but at the same time, serialization slows down the process of absorption of a novel's plot because everyone's limited by the issue of the journal. You have to wait until the next uh, 
Um, to what extent have you found Dostoevsky's literary decisions, productivity affected by the, the question of serialization? Um, is there much in your work where you see this connection? Uh, your fir first book is about the age of disintegration. Yeah, I mean, I so I don't I, I certainly I'm interested in uh, in in questions of serialization, and I think what's interesting in a way with serialization is how other kinds of discourses also enter into the picture. So the novel is not in any way sealed off uh, from life. Instead, life kind of enters into it, right? Um, and of course, one of the great examples is the, the one of the great examples of how serialization affected Dostoevsky's novels is the Brothers Karamazov, right? When uh, readers were kind of after having read uh, the Rebellion and Grand Inquisitor section, the pro and contra book, readers were concerned Concerned, right, that that was where he was going to leave it, and he had to write to them and reassure them that no, he was going to provide an answer to Ivan after all, right? Um, but certainly, that I think in the Brothers Karamazov serialization seems to, in fact, allow that novel to absorb life in a sense, right, um, rather than uh, becoming sealed off. Um, the adolescent is interesting because um, that um, he in that novel he incorporates into the kind of epilogue um, some of the critiques um, of the novel by readers of the time. So he has a kind of character, um, this Nikolai, who's um, uh, his uh, Moscow landlord, um, has him, him um, level those very critiques at the um, protagonist narrator. Um, and so there, that's also another way in which I think he, serialization definitely enters into and, and, and may, you know, determines in a certain way the shape uh, of the novel uh, itself. Excellent, thank you. Um, question, uh, we just have a few minutes uh, left. Um, I, I would really like to ask you to reflect on um, the history of Dostoevsky studies in general. Um, the approach to Dostoevsky by literary scholars. Um, what kind of evolution has it undergone over the past um, roughly what 140 years that you know people have recognized him as a great writer and where do you see Dostoevsky's studies going from this 200th anniversary of his birth uh, over the next generation yeah so um i think um that's a huge question, right? Um, yes, although actually we, I recently wrote together with um, uh, Professor Catherine Bowers, we recently had to do a state of the field um, piece for Russian review. So I have thought about it a little bit, um, but um, what I'm of course, one of the great developments in Dostoevsky's studies was Bakhtin, right? And the discovery of Bakhtin and the sort of, um, I guess the move from, um, kind of psychological analysis of Dostoevsky's novels and the emphasis on character and so on uh, into um, sort of the analysis more of the, the discursive analysis, right? And focus on voices, focus on plot um, and so on. Um, what I think has happened in more recently is, um, and that I think is a great uh, development is the, um, the sort of the, the, the the formal analysis, but in the context of a kind of the greater discursive context. So um, how the journals of the day, how how different kinds of, and this is something that we very much represent in our volume. So how scientific discourses um, enter into uh, dialogue with Dostoevsky's novels, uh, the importance of kind of new economic uh, theories and so on, things like that. That's something that has really developed a lot. Um, and I think one of the interesting um, developments is also um, the, the, in some circles at least, the move away from um, the, the strictly canonical approach to Russian literature, right? So the monograph approach to Dostoevsky that you, you know, write a book on Dostoevsky mm -hmm. to the consider of, 
consideration of Dostoevsky within a broader uh, framework. So the 19V, which is a group that meets uh, at NYU at the Jordan Center, um, uh, a lot of people are, are working on uh, some non-canonical Russian writers and on sort of the institutions of Russian literature and, you know, the ways in which some of these more minor writers kind of um, uh, engage with Dostoevsky um, and he engages with them. So sort of a, a more, I guess, a broader view of what um, Russian li literature, how Russian literature is constituted, uh, which I think doesn't take away from Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and so on, but in fact um, gives new perspectives. Um, so. Excellent. Um, and listen, uh, perfect timing. Um, Kate Holland, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for those of you who have joined us, uh, the latest book is Dostoevsky 200, The Novel in Modernity. And if you, it, it's an edited volume. So if you, I encourage everyone to buy it because you will get a taste of these new approaches to Dostoevsky with the short and eminently readable um, uh, essays. A great introduction to the different uh, ways of uh, reading uh, this great writer. So again, thank you for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at future Carmel Institute events. Uh, have a great week, a great weekend, a great holiday season, and uh, we will see you all soon. Goodbye.